Good morning and welcome to University Unitarian Church. My name is John Luopa and I'm here with my colleague Beth Cronister, together with our musicians Dwight Beckmeyer and our soloist Jenny Spence, who will provide this worship service. Happy to share this worship service with you this morning. Just one announcement before we begin the service, and that is that following the service this morning, after some minutes, when after we conclude, we invite you to join us for a budget hearing in advance of our annual meeting, which is on the second Sunday in June. It's been a good year and a tough year on both counts, and it would be great if you could join us for some time as our Board of Trustees uh, presents to you the budget that they will be presenting at the annual meeting. This is your opportunity to ask questions and get the information you need to know heading into that meeting as there will not be as much time during that meeting uh, for us to do so. Let us begin the service this morning with our prelude. Friends, it has been one of the worst weeks in a very long time in our long history as a country. We have surpassed 100,000 deaths from the coronavirus. The economy is still in shaky shape. Many more are unemployed, and we have absolutely no leadership at the top of our federal government. In addition to this, we all witnessed the brutal killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis earlier in the week, and all hell has broken loose. What we are reminded of, what white people are reminded of again, is that it is not safe to be a person of color in the United States still after 400 years of our history. And the reason for that is, as we know, that the superiority of whiteness is the law of the land and always has been. And that will not change until those of us who benefit from that law are willing and able to dismantle it and to broaden it to include all people, all races, all classes, all genders, all people. As a community of faith, we have committed ourselves to becoming a beloved community, which is a phrase that was introduced or reintroduced to the American people by Dr. Martin Luther King 
Jr. Some think that the phrase beloved community is nothing more than for all of us to be nice to each other, but that is the farthest thing from the truth. Dr. King understood beloved community to mean being a reconciling community, a community of healing and reconciliation, which requires of all of us that we reconcile ourselves to our tragic past and the ways in which some are privileged over others, most others, and that we correct those historic injustices. So we have made small efforts toward that in becoming a beloved community, but I think you know as well as I do that this is going to be the hardest work we will ever do as a community of faith. And I would add to that that there is nothing more important that we do as a community of faith, for we have no integrity if we do not honor that. That we honor George Floyd and his family and all those who have died in recent weeks and decades and centuries at the hands of an ideology which really spells death. Let us recommit ourselves to this work in our imperfect ways and make many mistakes in the process, sacrifice our own security and our own privilege on behalf of those who need to be welcomed to the table. Shocking, shocking videos at which I and so many others wept to think, have we made no progress in more than 50 years of our agitation for a just and compassionate community? Let's wake up. Let's step up. Let's move forward as a people, not for ourselves alone, but for our children and their children, and though for all those who suffer today. My opening words this morning are from the poet Adrian Rich, from her wonderful collection, In Search of a Common Language in 1978. You know the words, my friends. My heart is moved by all I cannot save. So much has been destroyed. I must cast my lot with those who age after age perversely with no extraordinary power, reconstitute the world. Let that be our prayer and our hope. Amen. I invite you to join me in singing the doxology, which you will see soon on the screen, and to remain standing or sitting for the opening hymn, Sound Over All Waters.
Hello, friends. I'm Laura Randall, and I would like to share a story with you about the origins of the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee, or UUSC. This story was adapted from the history Righteous Among the Nations, found in the UUA's Tapestry of Faith curriculum, Faith Like a River. Working through the night, Martha and Waitstill Sharp burned all their notes and papers. After this night, they would keep no records of the refugees they smuggled out of Nazi-occupied Europe. For their own safety and for the safety of those they were assisting, nothing could be written down. What had begun as a seemingly simple church mission had turned into a very dangerous situation. The Sharps had recently left behind a life of comfort and privilege in Wellesley, Massachusetts, where Waite still served as minister. Now they found themselves secretly burning documents in an office in Prague, Czechoslovakia, on the night of March 14th, 1939. What had led to this moment? In 1938, an agreement called the Munich Pact gave the border regions of Czechoslovakia to the Nazis in exchange for a promise of peace. Hundreds of refugees fled to Prague's Unitarian Church as Jews, political dissidents, intellectuals, and others targeted by the Nazis looked desperately for safety. The American Unitarian Association asked Reverend Sharp to visit Czechoslovakia and coordinate relief work there. The Sharps left for Europe in February 1939, leaving their children ages three and six in the care of close friends from the Wellesley Hill congregation. When they accepted that mission, they did not know what lay ahead. At first, the Sharps' work in Prague included setting up a network of volunteers to obtain visas, passage, education, and employment for refugees. However, the situation for refugees rapidly deteriorated. When it became clear that the Nazis were approaching the city, the Sharps, instead of returning home, burned all their records and vowed to continue their work. The following day, the Nazis marched into Prague. On that same day, Martha guided a top resistance leader to asylum at the British embassy. Stopped by Nazi guards three times, Martha used her American passport to get both of them safely through each checkpoint. A few days later, Waitstill arranged for a member of the Czech parliament to be smuggled from a hospital by hiding him in a body bag. The Gestapo, which were the Nazi police, would not allow the work of people like the Sharps to continue. In July, their office was closed and all of their furniture thrown into the street. Still, the Sharps stayed on. In August, Waite still attended a conference in Switzerland and was not allowed to re-enter occupied Czechoslovakia. Under threat of imminent arrest by the Gestapo, Martha fled Prague alone, the Sharps reunited in Paris and sailed for home. In May of 1940, Frederick May Elliott, president of the American Unitarian Association, asked the Sharps to return to Europe as representatives of the newly formed Unitarian Service Committee. With much of Europe now under Nazi occupation, they worked from Marseille and Free France and in Lisbon, Portugal, the last port of hope for many refugees from Nazi-occupied lands. Like most of those resisting the Nazi regime in Europe, the Sharps had to get creative in their work to get people to safety. Once, disguised as a French peasant, Martha accompanied a man who was on the list of those most wanted by the Nazis. Together, they traveled to the Spanish border where Martha distracted the guards so they would not discover him. When no extra tickets for the transatlantic voyage to safety were available, Martha gave up her own ticket so that he could sail to New York with weight still. Not all the battles the Sharps fought were against the Nazis themselves, however. Martha worked tirelessly to find ways to break through the anti-Semitic United States immigration bureaucracy to allow Jewish children to come to the United States. Ultimately, the Sharps, along with others at the Unitarian Service Committee, helped more than 2,000 people escape from Nazi persecution, and they did not do this work alone. They had the support of Unitarians in the United States, as well as allies and other humanitarian agencies working in Europe. From the very beginning, 
the service committee knew that partnership and teamwork were critical to defending human rights and saving lives from oppressive regimes. UUSC continues to honor the courage and compassion of the Sharps today by working to advance human rights and challenge oppressive policies around the world. And just like 80 years ago, we can't do it alone. We need the help of people just like you to make our work possible. Thank you for being a part of the legacy of UUSC. And thank you for being part of our future as well. Friends, we now prepare ourselves to receive the morning offering, and I invite you to join me in saying the words that are printed here on the screen. This church is a community of ourselves. Its energy and resources are our energy and resources. Its wealth is what we share. When we contribute to the life of this community, we affirm our lives within it. As John spoke about, it has been a wrenching week in this nation. And so as we enter into a moment of shared prayer and meditation, I invite you to feel this week in your bodies.
whatever tensions are there, possibly holding on, or weariness, or disassociation. And remember that everything that happened this week happened to people's bodies or were explicit threats to people's bodies, black bodies, read as dangerous, treated without dignity, and harmed by those with systemic power. And the nation burns. Though truthfully, the fires of racism and white supremacy have been consuming the spiritual, material, emotional, and physical lives of people of color in this country for far, far too long. The soul of America is burning. And so this is not a prayer for healing and reconciliation, for that would be too hasty. This is not even a prayer for peace, for the conditions for peace are far from manifest. This is a prayer of lament, a prayer for the rawness and pain of this week. This is a prayer for those who are exhausted from carrying the burdens and bruises of racism, those who feel each succeeding death and their very bones in ancestral lines. This is a prayer for those who are angry, the ones who cut through the pandering and politics with truth-telling, righteousness and clarity, the ones who are done with black lives being treated as unworthy. This is a prayer for all who are grieving. The families, friends, and communities who will carry the memory of the living and the dead for years to come. A prayer for the parents who grieve that their child has no guarantee of safety in this culture. This is a prayer for those who are newly awakened, called out of silence and complicity by what they have seen and cannot unsee, questioning their enculturation and assumed innocence. Keep going. Keep questioning. Stay angry. But namely, This is a prayer for George Floyd, Ahmed Arbery, Tony McDade, Breonna Taylor, and so many more names known and unknown of black lives taken before their time by a system that largely kills with impunity. This is a prayer to honor their lives and their lives, the lives they won't get to live, the breaths they no longer take, and the holes they leave behind. This is not yet a prayer for healing and reconciliation, but it is a prayer for what is also alive within lament. For within lament are the seeds for hope, courage, and justice, and love. It is love that wails, love that grieves, love that calls, love that fights for justice. May love, as well as anger, as well as grief, as well as hope, guide us to such a day when healing and reconciliation might live among us and between us. Would you please join me now in shared breath in prayer. I 
I close with these words that are often sung by the Poor People's Campaign, authored by Yara Allen. Somebody's hurting my people, and it's gone on far too long. Yes, it's gone on far too long. Somebody's hurting my people, and it's gone on far too long, and we won't be silent anymore. This reading is called Thank You, Climate Strikers by Rebecca Solnit. It is an excerpt from a letter that first appeared in The Guardian on March 15, 2019, at the time of the first youth-led global climate strike. I want to say to all of the climate strikers today, thank you so much for being unreasonable. That is, if reasonable means playing by the rules and the rules are presumed to be the guidelines for what is and is not possible, then you may be told that what you are asking for is impossible or unreasonable. Don't listen. Don't stop. Don't let your dreams shrink by one inch. Don't forget that this might be the day and the pivotal year when you rewrite what is possible. I don't know what will happen. Because what will happen is what we make happen. That is why there's a global climate strike today. This is why I've started saying, don't ask what will happen, be what happens. Today, you are what is happening. Today, your power will be felt. Today, your action matters. Today, in your individual action, you may stand with a few people or with hundreds, but you will stand with billions around the world. Today, you are standing up for people not yet born, and those ghostly billions are with you too. Today, you are the force of possibility that runs through the present like a river through the desert. Here ends the reading. Would you please join now in singing hymn number 298, Wake Now My Senses. Keep with the world. 
On this morning, we join the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee in celebrating 80 years of justice work on the global scale and doing this through grassroots partnerships where faith lives together. The UUSC, you've been hearing and learning some of their, of their history, and we'll be learning more of it through the sermon brought to us by Reverends Laura Randall and Mary Catherine Morn. And just to give you some context of where we intersect and overlap, UUC is a longtime institutional supporter of UUSC, including many individual members who give and are active supporters to the organizations and members of UUC who have served on UUSC's board. We have also um, sent groups of people, intergenerational groups and groups of youth, to the border through their College of Social Justice program and had hoped to send another group this summer, um, delayed because of everything that's going on. But we will, again, travel with the College of Social Justice in doing these trips that are a blend of both witness and faithful action, committed to companioning the people who are there on the ground and learning from them. And so it's with, um, with joy, pride, and challenge this morning that um, we welcome UUSC to, uh, into our pulpit so that we might be part of that larger story. Greetings, friends. We are glad to join your worshiping community today for this UUSC Sunday service. Thank you. Hello, justice lovers. It's good to be with you in this virtual way. Like you, we at UUSC are finding our way in this difficult time. In addition to adapting to social distancing, working from home, homeschooling, caring for loved ones, mourning our losses, and finding new ways to connect, we are also discovering all the ways we are called to pivot in our work for human rights. Over the last weeks, we have reached out to all of our partners around the world. We are hearing from them and learning about the ways the pandemic is posing new threats to communities already facing so many longstanding threats. Together with our partners, we are striving to be nimble and creative in responding to needs that are emerging. We feel grateful for our history of deeply rooted partnerships, which makes it possible for us to move quickly to respond. For all of us committed to being a part of creating a world transformed by justice, we know that these commitments are more important now than ever, that it is in times of crisis that human rights for all are most at risk. We are grateful for this opportunity to share how UUSC works for a world transformed by justice, to share what has always guided our work and what guides us still. When we think of social justice and human rights, we often think of words like resistance, fortitude, resilience, and courage, perhaps especially courage. And sometimes this stops us. We know, we know courage. We've seen courage, but we often think of courage as something other people have. So today we wanna to start with imagination and move to hope because cur the courage to imagine and hope for a new world, a world reflective of the values we cherish is exactly the courage we need. Imagination and hopes are acts of courage because a vision of what more is possible demands that we move away from the sidelines. Imagination invites us to see beyond the current systems and norms, and hope points us toward new regenerative systems and norms reflecting the values we share. 80 years ago, in the face of rising Nazi repression, Unitarians imagined a different world, a different response from the US isolationism they knew there was a beloved community that cared about human rights across the country and around the world. And then they asked themselves what they needed to do 
to get closer to that different world. They asked themselves who else shared their vision for that beloved community. And they asked themselves what they were willing to risk to live their values in the world. They chose to form and support the Unitarian Service Committee. Now, I realize I keep saying they, but in reality, we chose to form and support the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee. You choose to form and support the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee. Those people 80 years ago were not separate or different from us, from you. They were regular people living average lives, worried about their jobs and children and bills, just like us, just like you. They were overwhelmed by the state of the world in a time of fear and pandemic, fascism and war, anti-Semitism and racism, just like us, just like you. When the opportunity arose for them to make a difference and affirm the inherent worth and dignity of all people across the world, they took action with their time, with their money, with their influence, just like us. Just like you do every time you write a letter to a politician, go to a protest, volunteer your time, or give your money to UUSC and our partners. For 80 years, our Unitarian Universal Service Committee, your Unitarian Universal Service Committee, has been working in partnership with those most directly impacted by injustice to create a different world, a beloved community, where every person's rights are honored and protected. We joined with migrant workers in Texas in the 1940s as they fought against exploitation. We launched desegregation projects in Georgia and Florida in 1960. In 1978, UUSC sponsored the first congressional fact-finding mission to El Salvador as violence there escalated. In the 1980s, we sent emergency funds to ease the Ethiopian famine long before the story reached mainstream US news. We sent emergency medical equipment to Rwanda in the 1990s and then launched the Drumbeat for Darfur campaign in the 2000s to help end the genocide in Sudan. In 2010, we went to Haiti to assist with immediate relief after the earthquake and remained to partner in long-term recovery. Today, UUSC works with organizations in Central America, Mexico, and the United States on the forefront of migrant justice as we seek security for people who wish to remain in their home countries, safety for those traveling along the migrant trail, and justice once people reach the United States. We partner with first and indigenous communities in the South Pacific, Louisiana, and Alaska, who are on the front lines of the climate change crisis as their homes and way of life are threatened by rising sea levels and rising temperatures. We are working with Rohingya leaders as they seek justice and healing for their communities following genocide and forced displacement from their homeland by the Burmese government and military. And we are joining with the minority Haitian community in the Bahamas after the devastation of Hurricane Dorian as they seek to rebuild their lives with no access to government assistance. I know sometimes, maybe a lot of the time, things can feel hopeless, like the world is moving farther and farther away from our values, from all the progress we have tried to make. At the time of the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee's founding, when it was officially known as the Unitarian Service Committee, the world gave few signs of moving in a better direction. The work of UUSC began in 1939, when Hitler's Germany was dragging all of Europe into war and laying the groundwork for the Holocaust. Thousands of refugees were already displaced from their homes and forced to flee religious and political persecution as the Nazis took power. When Martha and Waitstill Sharp opened the first office of the USC in Prague, they met an embattled Unitarian community at the Unitaria Church they had to preach their opposition to the Nazis in double meanings. During the German occupation of the city, the Nazi secret police began monitoring every sermon given at the Unitarian congregation, 
listening for subtle messages of dissent. A few years later, they found what they were looking for. In 1941, the minister of the Unitaria congregation, Norbert Chepik, was arrested and deported to the concentration camp at Takao, where he was killed with poison gas the following fall. Chepek had been personally named by Hitler on a list of 10,000 politically suspect persons slated for murder. Chepek wasn't the only figure associated with the founding of UUSC to make the ultimate sacrifice for human rights. USC's early work in Prague involved helping refugees apply for visas and process other paperwork they would need to seek safety abroad. Similar to UUSC's current model of partnering with directly impacted communities, the service committee's first employees were Jewish refugees working to protect the rights of their own community. At the time, Jewish people in Prague were already facing persecution under Nazi occupation and all the warning signs of the coming genocide were in place. They therefore knew the risks they took by staying in the city to help others. Nevertheless, historian Elizabeth Subek writes, they delayed their own immigration efforts to help other refugees. Ultimately, none were able to emigrate or avoid deportation to the concentration camps. In the face of genocide, religious persecution, political assassination, and all the worst atrocities the human imagination has ever devised, it was an indescribable act of courage for these women and men to hope for a different world. As it always is. In the face of genocide, religious persecution, political assassination, and all the worst atrocities the human imagination has ever devised, men and women fighting for liberation display indescribable courage. I am in awe of the courage I have seen and learned about through our partnerships at UUSC. And I have also come to understand that the first and most important thing required for courage is imagination. In the reading, activist and author Rebecca Solnit thanks the youth leaders for being unreasonable. She might have also said, thank you for imagining there is another way. Your being unreasonable is what we often hear when structures of power are challenged, when youth challenge their elders, when indigenous leaders challenge colonizers and industry and demand protection of community sources of water. When congregations, perhaps like yours, challenge authorities and regulations by welcoming a person into sanctuary. Vision and imagination about how things might be different are often discouraged and dismissed by the status quo. And when we allow ourselves to be discouraged, when we resign ourselves to our illusion of powerlessness, when we're cynical, when we don't believe there's another way, we are playing right into the hands of those in power. Our lack of imagination is a tool of empires and tyrants. It's how power gets away with conceding nothing. It's the courage we need right now, the courage to imagine. And the courage to imagine is so important now because it is through courageous imagination that we find the seeds of hope, radical hope, nourishing hope. It's a hope born of courage that can best be described in the often quoted phrase by the Reverend Jeremiah Wright, the audacity of hope. These words we are so familiar with today originally appeared in a 1995 sermon in which Wright was reflecting on the ravages of racism and apartheid in South Africa. Wright took as the text of his sermon a painting by the Victorian artist George Frederick Watts, whose depiction of hope shows a blindfolded woman playing a harp. Wright analyzed the message of the painting in these words. The harpist is sitting there in rags, her clothes are tattered as though she herself had been a victim of Hiroshima or Sharpfell. Yet the artist dared to entitle this painting Hope. See, in spite of being in a world torn by war, in spite of being in a world destroyed by hate, in spite of being in a world devastated by distrust and decimated by disease, in spite of being 
in a world where apartheid and apathy fed the fires of racism. In spite of all of these things, the woman had the audacity to hope. She had the audacity to hope and to make music and to praise God on the one string she had left. Friends, we have come as far as we have because justice seekers throughout time have continued to have the audacity to keep reaching towards another imagined possibility. At UUSC, we have joined with audacious, imaginative, hope-filled people for the last 80 years. And with your help, we will continue this vital work for the next 80 years. And the 80 years after that. We will continue to go where justice calls, partnering with those most affected by disasters and human rights abuses. So long as Unitarian Universalists, people of conscience and moral imagination continue to join with us, we will be here to join in the struggle, to lend our weight to bend the arc of the universe towards justice, to keep turning courageous hope into action. Thank you, my friends. Be well. Take good care of each other and keep the flame of justice kindled wherever you are today. Blessed be and amen. Would you please join now in singing hymn number 159, This Is My Song. Friends, immediately following the service this morning, there will be a budget hearing uh, in advance of the annual meeting. Those of you who are with us this morning through Zoom need not change at all. Just uh, take a few minutes of break uh, before the meeting starts. Those of you who are with us on the live stream, uh, we recommend that you go to UUC Connect or uh, to the Gateway to get the link and to come into the meeting which will be conducted uh, by the Board of Trustees. And we thank you for your attention to that. The closing words this morning were written by Barrows Dunham, son of a Presbyterian minister who for many years taught philosophy 
at Temple University in Philadelphia. He was considered a communist sympathizer and lost his position there, and no other major American university would hire him uh, for 15 years until the New York School of Social Research uh, hired him at the end of his career. Now, therefore, since the struggle deepens, since evil abides and good does not yet prosper, let us gather what strength we have, what confidence and valor, that our small victories may end in triumph and the world awaited become a world attained. So may it be. Amen.